Um, so today, uh, welcome. This, this is our October monthly meeting of the Southern Piedmont chapter of the Native Plant Society. My name is Craig Maxwell. I am the Southern Piedmont chapter chair. Um, and today we have Adam Bigelow with us joining, talking about natives for the vegetable garden. Um, before we get into that, I've got a few announcements for our chapter that I'd like to go through. Um, we are going to hold uh, questions for this presentation till the end. If you would like to drop your questions in the chat, um, you can do that. I'll also be pasting a lot of the links and dates and things like that that we mentioned in the presentation into the chat. Uh, if you have anything else you'd like me to add in there, please let me know. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Uh, Adam Bigelow is, um, I heard him speak at Cullowee Native Plant Conference over the summer. Uh, if you are ever able, able to make it to that, it's a wonderful experience. Um, he is a gardener. Uh, he is a big plant nerd. He he runs Bigelow's Botanical Excursions, which does everything from um, uh, wildflower walks to uh, consulting services and invasive plant removal and all sorts of education and, and workshops and, and things like that. And he just loves to talk plants, as many of us do. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Adam. Thank you so much, Craig, and a uh, big shout out to uh, the North Carolina Native Plant Society in general and your really incredible Southern Piedmont chapter. Y'all are doing really great work, and uh, I'm excited to be um, a little part of it today. And um, yep, uh, I live here in uh, Southern Appalachia. I actually live in, in what I call the, um, the heart of native plants of the Southeast, which is Cullowee, North Carolina couldn't get better than here. And um, I don't know about y'all there near Charlotte, but have you been seeing a bunch of monarch butterflies in the last little bit? We They've been passing through here and it's been very exciting. And I have other work I need to do, but all I want to do is go up on the Blue Ridge Parkway and chase butterflies. So that's what I do. Let me work technology. There you go. How's that work for y'all? Um, this is a, a topic that really marries a couple of my interests, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to come and talk to y'all today about um, native plants for your vegetable garden. So um, this is me, my background, but somewhere along the way, um, about 23, 24 years ago, I accidentally fell in love with wildflowers. Um, and it has been my longest, most successful relationship of my life. Um, and I've been uh, just goofy on the native plants of Southern Appalachia ever since. And I also am an avid uh, gardener, and I promote the use of organic and natural gardening methods. And I worked as a product. Um, I, I was the manager of a program called the Cullowee Community Garden. Uh, which is uh, still run by the Jackson County Department of Public Health on about um, around an acre of land right near the University of Western North Carolina, uh, WCU. Um, I'm also the vice president of our local Western North Carolina chapter for Wild Ones. And um, I saw Linda out there. So, hey, Linda with the Wild Ones. Um, Wild Ones is a uh, uh, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, um, organizations in the country promoting native plants, and they also uh, they want to see people using native plants in the landscape, and they want people to be using sustainable landscape practices. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and uh, we've been going for a little bit uh, close to two years now here in uh, Western North Carolina with our chapter which was the first, but now it's far from the only chapter of Wild Ones. So um, do a Google search after the presentation and see how you can uh, get involved with Wild Ones. And then it's a great way to uh, partner up and join with the uh, uh, North Carolina Native Plant Society and Wild Ones, which are fellow travelers with slightly different mission and stuff like that. Um, This is me encapsulated in four photographs. And so that's that's me on the top uh, left as you're looking at it, teaching about a, uh, a, a native sunflower, probably Helianthus angustifolius, on a Cullowee Native Plant Conference field trip in Panther Town Valley. Um, the top right, that's my house. That's where I'm at right now. 
Um, that's not a live picture, obviously. That's a little bit from the spring. But it is, uh, I've surrounded my home, and I'm using my home as a uh, arbor to support native plants. There is, um, it's the uh, uh, northern wild raisin viburnum, and then there's a coral honeysuckle and a Dutchman's pipe vine um, all in there. And there's a bunch of other plants that I know that they're, but, you know, they can't really be made out. But uh, it's about native plants in the landscape and bringing nature home, as we all know. And uh, the bottom left picture right here is actually taken from just above my house. And that's the view from the top of the pasture. And that is looking off towards um, the Balsam Gap and the Blue Ridge Parkway area. And then in the bottom right is one of my favorite places in the world. That's Panther Town Valley. And this is my good dog, Magnolia. Uh, her, her name's actually Magnolia Frazier. I uh, named her that because of the ears. And she'll probably hear me talking during our presentation today and try to bust in there to uh, get pets and stuff like that. So um, a few years ago, I started uh, an organization or my company, which is Bigelow's Botanical Excursions. And my good friend, Preston Montague, who is um, uh, just really blowing up in the native plant landscaping design and uh, education in the state did this logo for me. And so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but that is trout lily, what I consider the first flower of the year on the left air. And that's uh, the, one of the gentians. And uh, which one? Well, you know, that's the balsa mountain gentian on the right. It's a uh, very rare uh, plant you only find in, in high elevations. And then uh, everything else in between are my wildflower walks. So I take people for walks in the woods and they're short and they're accessible. And if you guys wanna plan a field trip for the chapter in the spring, come to Appalachia in the spring, it is magnificent. It really is all times of year, but the spring wildflowers are just special up here. And I'll show you all my favorite spots. Maybe not all of them, but some good ones. Um, I don't normally put uh, just a bunch of words onto the screen and then read them for people. But as I was, um, working on this uh, this topic, uh, which has been a new presentation for me this year, I found that um, I wrote this out in my notes and I really enjoyed it. And so um, I think that y'all are already on message with this and with some of the introductory things we're gonna talk about, but it really is, um, there. there's a lot of really big problems in the world, a lot of big challenges that we're facing as a culture and society. And, um, Many of those things are beyond our grasp to actually do something about. But I really believe um, that uh, to have a huge impact as an individual, one of the best things that we can do is to plant native plants, encourage native plants in our landscape, and remove exotic invasive plants from our landscapes. And um, there's a lot of different ways out there and information, of course. And um, I'm happy to talk about all those things. Um, before getting into the meat of the topic here, though, I do like to define terms. I think it's really important that we do that. And so um, exotic plants, are, in my opinion, and uh, the way that I operate and think about them, are those that don't have a co-evolved relationship with the uh, other plants, with insects, with microbes, and with people um, that evolved in a, in a bioregion. And because of that, they don't have that uh, connection with the other critters in and around. And so they don't fully participate in um, all of the ecosystem roles that plants do. In, in, um, so they came from another part of the world. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some problems and issues, even if they're not um, invasive. Uh, so... But are they also bad? You know, are all native plants good? Are all exotic plants bad? These are big questions, you know. So on the lower left is the um, beautiful uh, a stock photo of a really beautiful Japanese maple, and I, I love Japanese maples. I think they're gorgeous in their growth and habit. Um, and then actually on the bottom right is uh, uh, one of my favorite native plants with a beautiful uh, spring leaf emergence, nice yellow or red fall color, depending. 
And then um, they provide these beautiful blueberries during the winter that are overwintering um, poverty food for birds that uh, are staying around and not migrating. It also just happens to be poison ivy, which makes a lot of people um, break out and itch. And I get it. So is that a bad plant? Is um, Japanese maple a good plant or is it vice versa? I think one thing that we need to look at and start thinking about more are um, taking away that bad good dichotomy and looking at what um, plants do as a function and a role and um, what what their impact is on the other um, members of the community and uh, ecosystem in which they're in. And so um, I've started calling uh, poison ivy nature's wet paint sign. Uh, you know, it only negatively impacts one type of animal on the planet uh, that just happens to be us. And when you paint your bench or you paint a wall and you put up a wet paint sign, its job is to help keep people out of there and keep people off things until that bench or wall has a chance to recover from that fresh paint disturbance. And um, I think poison ivy which tends to show up primarily in disturbed and human disturbed areas might have a similar role of helping to keep us out of there until that area can recover from that disturbance. And it does a really good job of it unless you don't know what it looks like. Now, if you're a weirdo like me and you see a wet paint sign, the first thing you do is you go up and touch it to see if, um, if it's actually wet. And uh, then, you know, then I have to clean the paint off of my fingers because yeah, it was wet. Um, so getting away from this good and bad and looking at what their functions are. And then with invasive plants, um, it can be really, um, they, they have such a, a challenge for our world. Um, there's a lot of different uh, definitions and different terms for them. And I think, um, I think it's really important for us to uh, remember to um, always include the word plants when we're talking about exotics, non-natives, aliens, foreigners, stuff like that. And even uh, I, I like to say native plants more than just natives because I do live here in the land of the uh, Cherokee, the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians, and um, they are native here. And so I don't want to um, you know, cause any uh, confusion. But the basic definition that I use on um, exotic plants and invasive plants and where do we draw that line is um, an exotic plant is one that wasn't here prior to European contact. And that does not necessarily mean that humans prior to European contact on North America or what they called Turtle Island um, didn't have a role in, in moving plants around or working with plants, gardening or any of those things. It's just that their um, methods were using traditional breeding methods and their, um, uh, it was a slow movement of plants that allowed for um, the uh, adaptation of the local ecosystems through there. And so, um, you know, in that definition, uh, corn and squash and beans are all native plants. And, you know, all you have to do is ask the um, squash bee that pollinates um, all of the squash we plant in our vegetable gardens. Um, about it because that squash bee evolved to pollinate squashes in the uh, East Coast. Um, and, you know, kudzu is a bad plant. Nobody's planting kudzu anymore, I don't think. You know, I remember uh, uh, hearing about maybe like 15, 17 years ago, somebody uh, had introduced a variegated kudzu and I just kind of choked a little bit. But, um, there's also something oddly beautiful about seeing those big kudzu monsters off in the distance, but you know, it really reduces the uh, impacts. Um, that one in the middle is Oriental bittersweet, the um, uh, non-native bittersweet. And uh, you're not supposed to sell that anywhere in the state, except um, in the fall in the mountains where people can go make wreaths from it. And then that's one of its uh, ways it spreads around. And as far as I know, that plant bittersweet, was introduced to North America at the uh, Biltmore Estate. So uh, thanks, Biltmore Estate. Uh, Tree of Heaven, I don't know who named it that, but they never tried to get rid of it. And now Tree of Heaven is being associated with spotter and lanternfly um, impact. So, okay, so we know about, the, this is what we're talking about when it comes to native plants, exotic plants, 
and um, invasive plants. And um, one thing that I do like to talk about, because I am an organic practitioner in gardening, um, and I also understand, I'm also uh, a North Carolina certified pesticide applicator um, with a forest and aquatic designation. So I can even buy the really nasty stuff. And um, part of me keeps that, uh, that my pesticide applicator's license current because so I'm just not some crazy hippie saying pesticides are bad, dude, but I'm a licensed, knowledgeable, crazy hippie saying pesticides are bad, dude. Um, if uh, everything was equal, then training teams of 100 people to go off in the woods and manually remove um, invasive plants at all signs would be a very effective way of doing that. But that's not cost um, effective. Human labor is very expensive. Um, but, you know, while native plants or invasive plants, excuse me, while invasive plants are certainly bad and cause harm, I don't know a single invasive plant that is connected with uh, birth defects in children or can be an endocrine disruptor in humans, as well as um, uh, other wildlife, especially aquatic wildlife. And uh, no matter what, um, some folks try to tell us or sell us, um, pesticides are harmful. That's the side part. It means death. And um, glyphosate and some of the ones that are non-restricted, triclopyr and some of these others, are uh, relatively benign and uh, less harmful in the environment. But we got to remember, that does not mean that they are not harmful and that they're benign. And also, Know this, um, glyph Roundup is not glyphosate. They're not equivalent. Roundup active ingredient is glyphosate, but Roundup also contains a bunch of unregulated chemicals that we're not allowed to know what they are due to proprietary protections. And so these are the um, adjuvants, the um, things added in to make the chemical glyphosate work better, uh, emulsifying agents, um, dispersal agents, um, surfactants to make it stick onto the leaves, and uh, even the blue dye. These chemicals are labeled as inert on pesticide labels, but they're not scientifically inert. They have um, impacts in the environment and can cause harm. And we don't know really what their synergies are when they're all mixed together, nor do we really study how by having them more effective and last longer on the leaves, how does that change any persistence of the relatively um, uh, easy to biodegrade uh, glyphosate? And so um, when it comes to land management, when it comes to, uh, if you're dealing with a hundred acres overrun in the Piedmont with um, all of the, the wonderful uh, selection of invasive plants that are, are out there in the woods, and you've got a team of three people trying to deal with it, then yes, uh, selective use of herbicide is the way to go. Uh, but for most of us at our homes, in small plots, we can really get on top of things and stay on top of things without using um, synthetic pesticides. And I think that's really the way to go for most home owners and, and small uh, groups. And especially if you're working with young people or volunteers, excuse me don't don't place a bottle of um round up into their hands and turn them loose because it can have some impacts and it certainly does um always wear the proper um uh personal protection equipment when you choosing to use those um invasive plant management can uh, use an uh, ipm approach which is an integrated pest management in which you try a bunch of different things and then as a last result you can have uh, the use of herbicides, and it can be a tool, but if it's your if it's your only tool in the toolbox, then I don't think that's a really great way of approaching things. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, invasive plants have all kinds of things that uh, lead them to um, being more uh, uh, that that they are uh, hard to to kill, and they make a lot of flowers and make a lot of fruits, and you know, in that little uh, rose hip on the uh, Multiflora rose, there's over 100 seeds inside each little rose hip. And uh, so they're very efficient at getting all that out. Um, basically, I tell people 
especially like when I'm giving talks at garden clubs and stuff, that if they walk into a box store and it says uh, easy to grow or needs no care, just to run, um, run away from that as soon as possible. Um, and uh, and don't believe them when they say um, that it's a sterile cultivar. You know, y'all know, y'all are on message already. It, the breath repair is a sterile, sterile cultivar. How many sterile cultivars of... Um, butterfly bush are popping up all over the place or, or some of these others um sterile cultivar usually means like um four to up to 10 percent of the seeds are viable um and uh 90 percent or 96 percent are not and then what happens is those viable seeds spread into the environment and revert back to one of the parents where all of the seeds are viable and then it spreads around um, so it's better just to plant native plants. Don't y'all agree? I think you do. And this is what we love about native plants. There's so many different things. Um, you know, when the, you can, uh, here in Southern Appalachia and around the Asheville area, um, especially with anthropogenic climate change impacts, increasing the uh, warmth um, of our winters, you can grow banana trees. And I see them. I see them planted and people might get bananas eventually. And I mean, I don't understand that, but the, a banana tree does not look like Appalachia. Not a bit. It's out of place. It has no provenance here. What looks like Appalachia to me is a flame azalea on Roan Mountain as pictured in this slide here. And um, thanks to the wonderful, detailed, beautiful work of Doug Tallamy, and especially all of his many, many grad students over the year, you know, somebody had to sit into that tree and bush and count how many times the birds leave to go gather caterpillars for their young or how many cat different kinds of caterpillars there are in an oak tree. And that's how they spend their entire summer. So bless those entomologists for giving us this wonderful connection of um, the work of Doug Tallamy to give more uh, detailed information to people to bring them in because, you know, uh, plants being easy to care for, easy to establish, require no pesticides and fertilizers and things like that are really nice. And all that information about native plants is, is true, but none of that tugs on people's heartstrings. What tugs on people's heartstrings is baby birds and um, native plants support the wildlife, the ecosystem um, that allows for little baby birds to be fed by their parents. And it's it's a really great thing. And so um, yay native plants and yay native, North Carolina Native Plant Society. It's, uh, it, it's a great thing. Um, this is a slide that contains just a couple of pictures that speak to me of Appalachia. Um, up on the, the left, that tall one, are two North Carolina high elevation endemic plants, meaning that you only find these plants growing in the wild, in the foreground. Wow, I wish I could get this into the horticulture trade and get it out there to y'all in the Piedmont to grow in your landscapes because it's an amazing plant. This is a native Pieris. This is the mountain Andromeda. It's Pieris floribunda. But that plant only grows above um, 4,500 feet in Southern Appalachia. And it does not go leave the mountain. I can't even, I, I don't think I'd be able to get it growing here at my house. And I'm at 3,600 feet in Cullowee. It's just one of those high elevation dependent plants. And then behind it in the pink is another endemic that you can get um, and buy from Carolina Native Nursery, among others. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which is the pink shell azalea. Uh, but you only find that plant growing out in the wild in the southern Appalachia at high elevation, and it's really special. Top right, one of my new plant favorite plants, um, Sedum glaucophyllum. This is the cliff stone crop. It's uh, beautiful. It's related to the regular stone crop, Sedum ternatum, but this one likes um, full sun and uh, grows on uh, high elevation rock outcroppings, and uh, it propagates like all of the succulents super easy. And bottom right is a uh, leather flower, Clematis viorna. And then in the middle of there is, is uh, my um, 
uh, harbinger of spring, my my uh, favorite plant to uh, go searching for and to stalk to see the very first one. Um, every year here in, in Southern Appalachia, I try to see that first one blooming of trout lily and this past year. Usually it's, um, my average is about February 14th. This year I saw the first one blooming um, in an area called Moses Creek on February 5th. So those plants speak of Appalachia. That's why we're doing this, native plants. For this presentation, I decided to um, kind of look at how we use plants in our landscapes and gardens in many different ways. And because um, over time I've been, uh, you know, a, a vegetable gardener where, you know, if I see anything eating on the leaves of my vegetable plants, it's kill it. How dare you eat my plants? And then a native plant gardener who I'm welcoming insects that chew on the leaves of the plants. And so um, vegetable garden in the backyard, um, native plant formal garden in the front yard and keeping all these things separate, I started trying to blur those lines between them. So I went for this presentation and went looking for what do we use plants in the landscape for? And then had the thought, you know, of over time, why, how can we bring some of that deeper ecological function of the native plants in? And so, um, that's what we're here for today. So uh, let's see. Um, if you want to attract beneficial insects, pollinating insects and predators, what's better than a native plant that co-evolved with those insects? Um, uh, it's And so I would see a lot of at presentations or in books, I would see a lot of people recommending how to attract beneficial insects. And they're all using exotic uh, uh, standard garden flowers and recommending planting these things at different times of year. This list is not extensive. It's not um, comprehensive by any means. But the idea is that you want something growing around your vegetable garden all year long in flower. And so um, representing early, mid, and late um, flowers. I'm having a little low battery issue with my uh, headphones. We'll see if uh, if that continues. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the earliest things to bloom are the red maple trees and native bees go crazy for that. Uh, golden ragwort, great plant, early violets, columbine, all the summer things. And then it's so important to have uh, flowers blooming at the end of the season. And they're the hardest ones to get people to not chop down with their weed eaters because they're just green weeds throughout the year. Um, the use of trap crops is a really neat approach. Thank you. Uh, it's a really neat approach to um, uh, dealing with the base egg, uh, garden pests. And one of my favorites, but so you can plant something that they like to eat better than what you're eating, or they eat a part of a plant that isn't the part you eat. Um, one of my favorites for Japanese beetles is that evening primrose. And you can go out in the morning with a full grown evening primrose around your vegetable garden and um, find it loaded with Japanese beetles who are resting there overnight. And then, um, you know, it works way better than one of those Japanese beetle traps that if you do want to use those, just uh, don't put it in your yard. Just talk your neighbor into planting one down, putting one up down the street. Those pheromone traps spread um pheromones that attract japanese beetles from all over the place and you're trying to get rid of them so that's not what you want to do but in the morning with a, a evening primrose you can go out in the morning and it is just covered up with japanese beetles and then out comes my uh dirt devil my dust buster and i vacuum them up and then uh 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 dump that into the chicken yard or you can dump it into a, a, a container with some soapy water and get a lot of bang for the buck there. Um, also know that if you're eating um, the fruits, uh, then blackberries and, and raspberries can be a good trap crop for some of the leaf uh, chewing pests and invite them in. We all know this diversity is supported by native plants and um, 
if uh, uh, if you don't take anything out of this this talk today, um, I want to make sure that you have um, this plant in your garden. Um, this is the short tooth mountain plant. It's an incredible plant, um, and it is a. Uh, uh, a few years ago, the University of Delaware and the Mount Cuba Center did some research trials looking at what native plants attracted the most number and diversity, different kinds of uh, beneficial insects. This plant took number one or number two in every category they looked at. It is a rock star, and it tends to grow like a cultivar, even though it's a straight species, this uh, muticum. Um, and uh, um, so in the bottom right, you can see where this is a picture from downtown Silver, North Carolina. There's the old courthouse up there. And um, I had planted this, a handful of plants. And over time, it turned into a hedgerow of mountain mint. And if you're growing short tooth mountain mint, you know what I'm talking about. When, um, when this thing is in bloom and it has a long bloom time, all summer long, it is loaded <coughs> with a diversity of insects that I don't see on any other plant blooming. Um, I have sat and spent way too much time when I had other jobs to do in the garden. I have spent way too much time just looking and watching uh, the short tooth mountain being pollinated by insects. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. And I've counted over 40 critters on it at once and different kinds of things. So, uh, bees, native bees, honeybees, large black and blue iridescent wasps that I only see when the mountain is blooming. They'll have ants and beetles. I've seen fireflies, moths, and butterflies all on it at once. Giant bumblebees, really tiny, um, those uh, green or gold metallic uh, little tiny bees, the sweat bees and stuff, all on it at once. None of them minding if I'm taking their photograph. And um, it's just a great plant. I, I love this plant so much. And I think all of us uh, can have this. It's going to flower more in um, full sun, but it can handle part shade as well. And uh, it's readily available in the nursery trade. A lot of fun. This plant, if you if you know people with a fear of flying insects, this is a immersion therapy on steroids right here. This is such a wonderful plant. Uh, so get your short tooth mountain in. We grow flowers for aesthetic beauty and, uh, you know, not just uh, benefiting the ecosystem, but benefiting our eyes. <coughs> that is, um, right here is a uh, Hypericum frondosum, probably the sunburst cultivar. And just like with the mountain, when it's in bloom, it's coated with insects. And uh, when I took this photograph, of this uh, uh, sunburst hypericum, I had seen the native bee, a fuzzy little uh, mason bee or whichever one that is. And I might've noticed this little smaller bee, but I did not see that little critter on it. And that's quite often the case um, when you see a bunch of, uh, when there's multiple small flowers that provide nectar, on a, a composite type head, whether it's a true composite or just so many stamens on this and nectar producing, then the big bumblebee types can't bully these smaller bees and insects away and more and more and more uh, insects can get on there. I didn't necessarily set out to make this uh, slide all yellow, but when I was looking for photographs, so I just turned into that. This is Onothera fructicosa right here, the uh, sun drops. There's Carolina bush pea from Opsis villosa, really great native plant. Um, and then this is a green headed coneflower, the cut leaf coneflower, Rutabecchia lisciniata. It's a, a really attractive cut flower and a beautiful part of the vegetable garden. It has some other benefits too. Um, now, I know we all probably just had lunch right before coming here, but uh, we grow plants to eat them. And we love, I love to eat plants. And um, there's all kinds of things you can eat. In fact, all the different plant parts that we do eat, there's uh, most of them you can find a native plant that's going to provide that 
Now, I'm not suggesting that we have to take our entire vegetable garden and uh, turn it just into plants that are native you know, to the southeast, and that's all we can grow. I don't suggest that at all. I definitely don't want us growing any invasive plants in our, our yards and landscapes um, and vegetable gardens and stuff like that, too. But um, the uh, just remember that the uh, southeastern tribes, Catawba and Creek and Cherokee, and so many others did exist and thrive in large, large numbers on gardens made up of native plants and things that we take for granted. Strawberries are native and um, blueberries are native to Southern Appalachia and the Southeast United States. Um, you know, you can eat roots of uh, different things. I love groundnut. If y'all have never tried groundnut, it's such a really interesting Plant. This is Apios Americana. There are some improved varieties with larger uh, tubers, but it's in the pea family. It does really great. Um, right now around my house uh, for herbs and spices, the uh, spice bush, Lindera benzoin, is putting on a show of berries. And um, those berries are really delicious when cooked and used in um in a dish, you can throw um, a handful of those berries, the pulp, into uh, your soup or stew for the fall, and it's going to elevate that flavor, and nobody will really be able to pick out what made that so delicious, and you can win a um, soup contest if y'all have such. So um, all the different things, even oils, various tree nuts can be pressed out for oils, even primrose oil has some benefits and sunflower oils are great cooking for stuff like that. And some of the plants that um, people like to talk about and teach about are very rare and you don't find them everywhere. But this is a violet that will be blooming out in your yard this spring. And uh, mountain folk, Appalachian settlers, used to take violets and candy them by dipping them in the sugar water and letting it dry. And then it would take on a nice... Um, glistening, or you could even get fancy and paint on sugar and um, egg white and then use it to decorate cakes and stuff. But the violets become a part of my spring salads. They're so delicious. And anything that has a, a dark color, blue, purple, and red in nature, that's anthocyanins, that's nutrition. Um, free, helps get rid of free radicals in their system, helps improve the way things flow. But I not only do I eat these uh, violets, but I eat the violet leaves a lot. They're a great salad green. Um, as long as you're not harvesting or foraging from a place that's been sprayed by herbicides, um, collect the violet leaves. Add them into your salads. Add them into your uh, soups. Um, a violet leaf has five times more vitamin C per volume than orange. Um, now, granted, to get the same volume as an orange, you would need a big bowl of violet leaves. But once you have that big bowl of violet leaves, you got five times more vitamin C. It also has the precursor to vitamin A, which our bodies create when they eat it, uh, which the orange doesn't have. And it wasn't grown in industrial agriculture conditions in um, South America or Central America. And then harvested early, artificially ripened as it's shipped using fossil fuels to sit on the grocery store shelves where uh, only about, you know, 60% of them at the most are sold and the rest get thrown away. But these violets were picked for free in your yard in the morning. And uh, the only fuel cost is like what you had for breakfast. Um, violet leaves also have a nutritional component that uh, uh, younger folks don't think about too much, but the older we get, the more we start to need this. Um, in botany, we call it um, mucilage. That's the sliminess. That's the slick sliminess of some things like okra and other stuff like that. That's hard to market, really. But um, in nutritional science, it's known as soluble fiber. And so we eat a lot of soluble fiber. On a side note, the number one product of soluble fiber sold on uh, in stores and advertised on TV still is Metamucil. So really, that's Metamucilage. And um, this, these violet leaves are loaded with soluble fiber. And that mucilaginous nature of them is not very pronounced when you're eating them raw, but it can be come out when it's cooked a little bit. And so you can actually gather 
uh, pilot leaves, even it all through the summer, and use them to help thicken up a soup or a stew. And it's not going to change the flavor of that super stew because it has a very mild flavor, but it will um, give you all those soluble nutrients and uh, make your make your sauces a little bit nice and thick. So, um, we grow plants for medicine and we use plants for medicine. And I am not an herbalist and there's a lot of information out there um, for uh, using plants as medications. And you really want to be... Um, careful and knowledgeable and talk with someone who is a, uh, or, or learn from people that are very knowledgeable about the different contraindications and when and how they can negatively, uh, plant medicine can potentially interact with pharmaceutical uh, Western European type based medicines too. But, um, you know, there's so many um, herbalists uh, that are taught under the European herbalism. So they're knowing, talking about European plants and um, there's no reason that we have to bring a black elder uh, Sambucus nigra and plant it around to get the benefit when we have Sambucus canadensis growing everywhere and it's um, that that plant right there is the uh, flu shot um, and it's better than the flu shot because it doesn't have to try to predict which um, strain or variety of the flu might become virulent this year it's effective against all viruses and um, is a really great plant and tastes really good. Um, if you are foraging for your wild foods and medicines, um, I definitely promote this idea of preservation through propagation or conservation through propagation, where instead of just digging the wild plants up and bringing them home either to use or to grow in our gardens to use, and instead of that, I recommend propagating those plants by collecting uh, propagable materials. It's a great time of year for uh, collecting seeds and growing them off or getting them ready to grow. And so we can have these medicinal plants. And when we propagate instead of just harvest, then the mother plant gets to continue living out in the woods. And we get to have it in our landscapes and in our gardens too. And it's the best of both worlds. And uh, I remember years ago learning about a 25% rule in foraging. And I just want to, um, I've, I've moved it back to 10% for my own use and what I teach and, and ask others to think about um, because we can have uh, a real negative impact. If people are being taught, it's becoming more and more popular to go forage for food and medicine. And I support it. It's a great way of doing it. But if we don't teach the ethic, we only teach the how, but we don't teach the why or when or what, um, then we can really do damage to the ecosystem. Right now, I know that um, uh, the Indian ghost pipe or ghost pipe is um, starting to gain some uh, popularity on some uh, social media posts about its uh, uh, health medicinal benefits. And I would hate to see that plant getting um, uh, over harvested and not be able to find it in the woods. So uh, when you're collecting 10%, 10% of the seeds in the head, 10% of the seeds on one plant, 10% of the plants in one population, and just try to take less and give more and spread some seeds around, grow from home. And then once you have it growing at your home garden or landscape, then use that for the food and medicine, and we can keep the uh, other plants in the woods going. Um, this is the spice bush flower, a uh, really great plant. If you're buying these from a nursery, make sure um, to see if they've sexed them, especially if you're wanting the fruits or you wanna have fruits because they have separate male and female plants. They are um, dioecious plants. So uh, it's a great plant. It, those flowers in the springtime are so tiny, but they're loaded with this flavor. You can make tea from the flowers. You can make tea from the, the bark and the little stems at any time of year and the beautiful fruits. Plus, you get to support um, spice bush, swallowtail, butterflies. And this is one of the primary host plants for that. So um, this is a great shrub for the shade on the story. Um, really lovely. It's one of my favorites. Um, 
when it comes to harvesting wild plants out in the woods, though, there's one group of plants that I'll promote you using for food and medicine, and that is invasive plants. And it's a great way that a few of the people that I know up in the western uh, part of the state promoting and doing this. Um, one is Mark Williams, who's got a really comprehensive, um, he's an ethnobiologist, and he's got a really comprehensive um, uh, database of invasive plants medicinal use. And um, it's a really great thing. And then I give a shout out to Lauren Bacchus from Country Culture, because she's trying, she and her nonprofit organization are doing great work to try to build up some economic markets for kudzu products as a method of control. And, you know, that can certainly, if people aren't um, getting the whole message or just taking little bits, it can blur some lines between promoting these invasive plants and um, promoting their use as a method of control. Uh, Lauren Bacchus does a good job dancing that. But um, uh, some medicinal plants have are really great flavor. Um, kudzu itself, you know, the flowers, if you're driving down the road and it's bloom time, you'll smell great Kool-Aid everywhere. Kudzu jelly, kudzu leaves are edible, all kinds of uses. Um, medicinal benefits, um, uh, the barberry, I've heard a new common name for barberry that I'm starting to use, and I might tra uh, trade it out in this slide going forward, but it's called um, tick breeder, barberry, tick breeder, because bark the Japanese barberry species are um, really being found to support large numbers of ticks. And if you want to get people to hate something, just mention ticks and they'll go out and kill it. But um, Oregon grape, a native plant to North America, but not native here, and Japanese barberry are loaded with berberine, which is one of the active compounds that people will seek out in Golden Seal, Hydrastis canadensis. That's a great native plant and has been. Um, overly harvested and as a plant that, that is at risk. And so why not just get that from, uh, get those medicinal benefits, very similar ones, by um, removing invasive plants. But not if you're using synthetic herbicides. Don't eat the weeds that you spray. But otherwise, eat your weedies. Um, mimosa flowers is a very great medicine for nerving, relaxing tonics and um, tinctures from that. Help you... Uh, reduce anxiety, get to sleep, and different stuff like that. And when you harvest all the flowers off of the, the tree or cut the tree down um, to be able to get the tall flowers and then paint the stump with herbicides so it doesn't come back, you can have that medicine and help reduce their spread as well. And then eating weeds, oh boy, I wish we could um, eat enough Japanese knotweed to get that plant around. But um I have a new friend, uh, her name's Jessica. She's a, a AmeriCorps volunteer with the Highlands Cashews Land Trust. And she has fallen in love with the flavor of autumn olives and is just going around every population she can find and trying to get every single uh, fruit off of there to help reduce its spread. And so it's a really great approach. Eat the garlic musk as we kill it. Eat it. It's delicious. And that's golden seal. Already talked about that. It's a really great native plant that has just been over harvested. Um, second only, probably in popularity, uh, to uh, uh, ginseng. Um, native plants, we use plants in our gardens for uh, compost fodder or to uh, filter water to slow the uh, soil erosion and in a bit of. Uh, uh, a nutrient cycling, including this thing that permaculturalists love talking about, which is dynamic mineral accumulators. These are plants that supposedly uh, go spread their roots really deeply into the soil and pull up mineral nutrients, things like comfrey. But um, it's not really uh, all plants do that on some levels. And so we can uh, have some really fast growing um, weedy native plants that we can use as um uh, fertilizers or as um, uh, compost or mulch and different things like that. And then uh, the, again, the permaculture is not to beat them up. Permaculture is a great approach for growing food, but they tend to be very uh, 
uh, human centric or anthropocentric and if it's a plant that benefits people then it doesn't matter what it does out into the ecosystem and i don't support that so they often promote planting um autumn olive eleagnus angustifolia for its nitrogen fixing benefits and you know i think there's some uh real questions of do we really need to nitrify um the soils or is there is there plenty coming but also um there's some really great native plants that are in the pea family that will do that nitrogen fixation. Trees like honey locust and black locust. And with honey locust, wow, if you've never had the uh, the sweet, sweet insides of a honey locust pot, it is delicious. I had honey locust pie one time. It tasted like it tasted like honey locust, but it had the consistency of a pecan pie. It was really nice. And then there's that ground nut again, APS Americana not only producing really delicious edible um, tubers, but um, is a, a pea family plant that can do some nitrogen fixation. And it's a really gentle climbing plant that climbs up everything. Um, sorry, a little preview there. We also use plants for um, stream bank stabilization and filtering water. And when I was looking for a couple uh, example photos of that, um, I've listed up here in the slide, river cane, um, the elderberry, Button bush. Um, some really good ones are hazel alder and silky willow. And these are all plants that you can uh, plant using the uh, dormant season, um, uh, uh, the stump sprout. The words have gotten away from them because I'm excited that I couldn't find any pictures of my own of the hazel alder and silky willow. So instead, I threw up a picture of my cats here on the left laying down is. Um, Hazel alder on a serrata, and then on the right, sitting up, looking at us, is my cat, silky willow, um, Salix sericea, and um, yes, those are their full names on file at the veterinary clinic. And so, when I get an appointment reminder, it says it is now time for hazel alder on the serrata's vet checkup, and I laugh, and I know that that text really hurt. So, but it, it makes me laugh on it. So that I, I had my dog in the in the slide so i had to throw um the cats in and i'm going to start wrapping this up and try to leave some time for uh questions as we're moving along i wanted to share with y'all um some of my favorite plants and um talk to you a little bit about some of their uses and stuff some i've mentioned already and others not but um these are things that are growing around my vegetable gardens there are things that i've grown in, in and around uh the community gardens that i used to manage and they're great, great plants. So let's see. Passion flower. Um, passion flower is the host of the fritillary butterflies. And you can see on this photograph, there's actually a caterpillar of uh, one of the fritillary butterflies. And um, not only that, but they're really just, there's no other plant flower out there in our woods that, that in the woods around us that looks so stunning like this. And then it is, has this amazing um, co-evolved relationship with the bumblebees that pollinate it because the bumblebees, the big, the big hairy ones, um, they're just the exact height to be um, crawling around the base of this flower, drinking nectar. And then that height of their bristly hairs on the tops of their backs is the exact height that the uh, flower displays its um, uh, uh, stamens and the anthers that have the, the pollen gets brushed onto their back. And it's just an amazing co-evolutionary thing. This is food. So the uh, may pops themselves, the uh, fruits of the passion flower can be eaten or, or delicious. You can make a little jelly. The leaves of passion flower are really great. Plus you can make a tea from the leaves that has a relaxing nerving quality to it and it climbs very gently and uh this thing spreads and grows and some people are like are, are are not happy with that but i say you know eat your wheaties and every time it sprouts up somewhere you don't want it just throw it in your salad it's delicious this is the green-headed coneflower this is where rudbeckula semiata but in the spring this plant in cherokee is known as soshan the soshan is among the favorite spring tonic herbs of Cherokee people whose land I'm on here in Western North Carolina. 
and it is a really great um, cooked herb or pot herb um, for sauteing or cooking up with some other greens. It has a very strong flavor, and um, it has this tonic nature, this spring tonic nature. So, you know, um, uh, you know that that uh, first warm day of the spring, late winter. Um, and you know, hope returns and everything feels good in your life because it's nice out. Well, eating a mess of um, Soshane gives me that feeling from the inside out. It uh, makes my fingertips tingle with hope and joy. And that's a uh, one of the, um, I believe that's a, uh, a, sorry, the butterfly there is one of the, uh, it's not spice bush swallowtail, but the uh, uh, pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. Um, great nectar support from this composite river of the Hester. Uh, there's my house again. And this time it's got covered up in jewelweed. Jewelweed is food. You can eat the seeds. They taste like mini walnuts. You can eat the leaves when they're first emerging if it's growing too much for you. Uh, really delicious. It is medicine. This is both cure and prevention for poison ivy. Um, it's an annual and it's an amazing hummingbird feeder. Um, and, uh, it's just really great. And I have this, uh, really simple propagation method. If you want, uh, jewelry growing in an area where you don't have it already, what I like to do is I'll take a plant tray, fill it with potting mix, set it under jewelry, and then walk away. This method takes about 15 minutes of work and about three years to establish a new population because the seeds of jewelweed, the touch me not, are ballistic seed dispersal and they launch those seeds around and it'll launch it all into the trays that you set a potting mix below it. Then once the plant dies back around this time or a little bit later, you go and pick that tray up, put it down on the ground where you want jewelweed to grow. And then jewelweed will launch itself out. It'll flower the next year and then launch and spread its seeds around and then in year three, you have a brand new established naturally growing population of jewelweed. And as long as you don't chop it down, it'll keep growing for you. And the hummingbirds will thank you. They're they're all over it. It's just a great plant. It's it's like nature's bubble wrap. Um it's it's leaves shine silver. It's just got so much fun. I love this plant a lot. I could go on and on about it, but I won't. Um this time of year, of course, the golden rods are everywhere. Uh they're not causing people's uh uh, fall season allergies, even though they get blamed for it, their pollen is too large and heavy to fly in the air and get into your nose to cause a histamine reaction. And the only way you can get pollen of goldenrod into your nose um, is to pick one of the flower stalks and shove it up into your nose. And I don't recommend doing that because um, they're loaded with bees and wasp at this time of year, and that bee will... Uh, sting you on the inside of your nose, and then you'll definitely have a histamine reaction with that. Um, this is a wonderful, beautiful plant. It's edible, and it's also medicinal. And so I'm not a big proponent of um, uh, conspiracy theories, but I also don't trust the large pharmaceutical companies. And we've known that goldenrod does not cause all seasonal allergies for years and years and years. But you still see goldenrod pictured on the front of... Um, uh, allergy medications, especially the store brand ones. And you'll subtly see uh, yellow flowers in the background of all the allergy med commercials on TV. And this is where the conspiracy comes in because not only does goldenrod not cause your uh, fall season allergies, but goldenrod, the flowers and leaves can be made and brewed into a fresh tea that relieves the symptoms of fall season allergies better than any of those medications, and also with uh, no side effects and very few contraindications. So let's praise goldenrod and keep people from chopping it down and blaming it for their allergies. St. John's wort, <clears throat> beautiful plant. Um, this is one of the uh, woody ones, one of the special uh, woody ones that grows up on the mountain. Uh, but it, uh, the herbaceous uh, St. John's wort is a very effective medicine against uh, anxiety and depression. And is uh, a, even if people don't know flowers or herbalism, they've heard of St. John's work for medicine. Now, I'm not here to make light of depression and anxiety. I, I have my bouts with it as well, usually in the winter. 
when there's no flowers blooming. But every time I see a flower of a St. John's wort or these beautiful seed heads, it uh, makes me smile and I feel better instantly. Um, milkweeds. We all know the importance of planting the, the Asclepias plants for um, monarch butterflies support and other pollinating insects. Uh, but you can also eat these things, even though they're toxic. Don't eat the leaves, but you can actually pick the flower buds or the blooming flowers and dip them in batter and deep fry them and make flower fritters. And that's pretty fun. And then I recently learned uh, one of their pollination tricks is that with all these um, little holes and tubes in there, when the insects are, are trying to get pollen, they'll actually get their legs stuck in there. So this this plant traps bees for just a minute. And as they're trying to shake their leg loose, it knocks a bunch more pollen onto them. I think that's a brilliant strategy. And then here's our um, asters for the fall. Um, incredibly necessary plants for monarch butterflies and nectaring. Um, this is one of many photographs that I've taken on the Blue Ridge Parkway during the monarch migration at the uh, Canyon Fork Overlook on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And um, it's just a, this is a magnet for uh, providing abundance of nectar for um, not just migrating butterflies, but butterflies getting ready to overwinter and for bees and wasps and everything. And it's beautiful. But because it's a fall blooming flower, late summer, um, most of the year, all it looks like is a green weedy mess and, and it often succumbs to crazy guy with weed eater. So um, don't let that happen. Let the asters grow. Uh, thank you all for your time. And I'm going to turn it back over to Craig, but I've got I've got time and hopefully we still do to uh, have any questions addressed, but also uh, a little promo. Um, I love taking people for walks in the woods, teaching them about plants and flowers. And I live in a beautiful part of the world where um, people can IQ out all the time to different places like waterfalls or views. Uh, my favorite destination or where the flowers are blooming. So you can find me at BigLowsBotanicalExcursions.com and you can also uh, email me any questions or play the WhatsApp prank game if you want on my social media or at BigLowNC at gmail.com and let's see if I can figure out how to turn it back over. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat. I want to uh, make sure we get to uh, the first one was you mentioned uh, the passion flower. Um, does Passiflora lutea have the same medicinal properties as Incarnata? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say um, I would suggest that it does, but it probably hasn't been looked at for um, its medicinal value just because of its uh, smaller size of everything. The, the, the fruits are smaller the leaves are smaller. And so it'll take a lot more harvesting. But if you have an abundance, I'd say I'd say try it. I've not heard of anything saying not to consume new food. It's a great question. Uh, and then the next one, one of the other questions uh, was, what was the process for using jewelweed on poison ivy? I know one person in the chat mentioned breaking the stem and rubbing the sap on the affected area. Yeah, that's the way I do it. And that's how I promote it as well. Um, you can make it into products, and I've seen it sold as soaps and saps, but I have a little question or concern about what the um, effect of the heat in making those products has on the chemical components that uh, that neutralize the toxicity of the, uh, the, the poison ivy. And, you know, up until just a few years ago, um, scientists were telling us that um, – that poison ivy was just a, uh, a folk uh, tale and didn't really have any impact uh, directly. And at the most, maybe some saponins and they were working like scrubbing with soap. But uh, some research came out uh, fairly recently showing that there are active chemicals in the uh, jewelweed that um, neutralize the toxins. So, what I do is it's in all parts of it. Of course, the juicy sap, treating the stem like um, aloe. I'll, I'll pick a stem and then just kind of tease out and squeeze it until it's got a, a lot of the juice there and rub it on there. 
if I know I've got to remove poison ivy, then I'll go and find jewelweed, coat myself with it, put it everywhere, go uh, and talk to the poison ivy and, and remove it, and then go find jewelweed and rub it on. If I didn't notice I was in poison ivy and I suddenly find the rash, I'll just grab the a uh, little side branch, it's usually all I need, and I'll crush it all up, the stem, the flowers, the, the leaves, until it's good and juicy and then use that for them. Yeah. Yeah, one of the other methods I had heard, um, you mentioned the heat, maybe, you know, having an effect on the active ingredients, but um, I had heard taking a handful of leaves, crushing them up in some water, letting it sit in water overnight, and then freezing that. And then you can just kind of break off little ice cubes to rub on uh, the poison ivy as you get it. Yeah, um, it, you it, can keep it for longer. Cool and, and icy, and that helps soothe and reduce. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, are there any recommended resources for knowing how to harvest and cook or eat some of the edible natives that you know? Of? Again, I'm sorry. Uh, are there any recommended resources for learning how to cook and harvest edible uh, native plants? Um. Yeah. Um. Yes, there is a wonderful collection of books. Um, even though he's not from the Southeast, you know, our, our wide range of, uh, of plant distribution, we have a lot of the plants that Samuel Thayer talks about. So Samuel Thayer is a um, amazing educator, and he's got three books, um, The Nature's Harvest, um, or The you know, the Forager's, yeah, Forager's Harvest, um, or nature's harvest, you can go grab it off the bookshelf. I need to, but Samuel Thayer, and he's got a really a new book out that I haven't that I bought, but I haven't dove into. I think that's what winter is for. Um, he's pretty much a go to, and one of the things about it, um, he talks about Peterson's field guide. And Peterson's got great guides for um, a lot of things, but uh, their wild foods guide actually because they don't they aggregate what is written about in other sources, there's some mistakes and some inaccuracies that could lead you to getting sick. Whereas Samuel Thayer, everything in his books is based on his direct use and harvesting and years of knowledge. And so he doesn't even have a disclaimer in front of his books. He has what he calls a claimer, where he says, everything in here is stuff that I've done. And if you follow the instructions, you can do it too. And he puts in recipes and everything. So it's a really great book. That's awesome. And I just posted, uh, it's Forager Harvest. I just posted the website link in the chat for anybody that's looking to learn some more. Um, and then Andrea mentioned Corey Pineshain wrote Medicinal Plants of the Southeast. Uh, might be another good resource. Oh, yeah, totally. And uh, Corey, Corey Pine is a really knowledgeable teacher, lives up here in the mountains. And so when it comes to the herbalism side of things, Corey, is one of the people that I promote uh, learning from in his new book. Um, and also he's got some online stuff. Um, uh, Patricia Christie Howells, uh, Medicinal Plants of the Southeastern uh, or Southern Appalachia is a really great resource. And her Botana Logos School of Medicine is another one. And then Juliet Blankenspor, uh, Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine, uh, brilliant brilliant educator and also has a uh, newer book that is just gorgeous so there's there's a there's a lot of other um great teachers and especially around uh buncombe county area it's a real hotbed for herbalism and promoting herbal medicine in their use and in fact the american herbalist guild is now based in the so. thank you um and I, I know someone asked if this would be, if, uh, if they can get a copy of the slide deck, we will have this presentation recorded and uploaded to YouTube here in the next week. Um, and if you registered for the Zoom meeting, if you're on the Zoom call, we have your email address and we will uh, send you a, a link to that YouTube video once it's up. Um, if there aren't any other questions. We want uh, to, oh, it was that answer. You did it, Elder Bear. Yeah, which plant is the flu shot? Elder, antiviral is all get out. Love that. Uh, then someone asked, does Cole Burl, plant expert for Virginia, have medicinal plant books that you know of? Not that I know of, but I do know that name. And there's there's a lot of older ones for medicinal plants and some databases and stuff. 
All right. Well, it looks like we don't have any other questions. Um, thank you so much for the presentation today. This is very awesome. It's always very entertaining. Uh, and and thank you to everybody who joined. Um, like I said, we'll be sending out the link to the YouTube uh, video for this in the next week or so. Um, thank you all and hope you, you have a good rest of your Sunday. You're welcome. Thanks, y'all. And yes, I mean Elder Barry. When I say Elder, um, I, I just saw that question pop up. I like calling it elder because we're supposed to respect our elders. And also, if I'm talking about it and I call it elderberry, it had it would have elderberry leaves, elderberry flowers, and elderberry berries, and elderberry berries, just for the big so Let's just call it elder. All right. Thank you all. We're going to go ahead and end the, end the video. All right. Thanks.